Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Krista Bible study. It's another Sabbath. We are in the lesson nine of this quarter. And uh, I want to promise you, just like uh, the ones we've studied in the past, it's also going to be important to your life as a Christian, to your life as a minister, and as a student of the Bible. And today, this, this week we were three, and the other week uh, we are also. But today, we have point, we are glad to be joined again by uh, our sister Quinta Machiki. And so before we begin, I just want to introduce the panelists. I'm going to be the host, I'm Barack Kowili. And I'm joined with uh, uh, three other individuals. I want to start with uh, Nyango Brian. Nyango, good morning. Uh, good morning, and uh, happy Sabbath, uh, and, uh, Kowili and the entire team. It's a privilege again uh, to come together to start the lesson today. Let's have a happy Sabbath ride. Thank you very much. We're blessed to have you. And thank you for your continuous attendance. Uh, I want to invite uh, Jovin for the ample. Jovin, good morning. Uh, good morning, Brother Kowili. I'm so glad to join you this morning. May we all be blessed as we study together. Thank you very much. We are glad in the past weeks you joining us from Kisumu, but we are glad you have joined us in Nairobi and one of these days we will have not a virtual one, but a real um, meeting. So finally, the only lady in this panel uh, this morning is Quinta Chuki. Quinta, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Thank you very much. We are blessed to have you. In the beginning, I want to have a word of prayer. And Quinta, would you have the privilege of praying with us? Let us believe and pray. <laughs> Dear Lord, we come before you this morning with a lot of gratitude in our heart because you've seen it fit that we, we facilitate the lesson today being a Sabbath morning, I want to pray that whatever we're going to discuss today may be a blessing to each and every listener. May you also help us with the network operations that it may be clear and audible. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And uh, thank you very much. And so I want us to go direct to uh, the study. As I said, for in the lesson number nine of this quarter, the title of the theme will subject. The overarching theme for this quarter is making friends for God's way of sharing in his mission. But the subject of this week has been developing winning attitude, developing a winning attitude. You know, you want to win in whatever circumstance you are in. If you're a student, you want to do the best. If you are an athlete, you want to be recognized for having contributed in a good way, or maybe for the season or something related to that. And I think even in the Christian life, there is a need that we develop a winning attitude because at the end of it all, rewards are coming. At the end of it all, people uh, will be rewarded according to the way we have worked. And so there is need for us to develop a winning attitude. A memory text, the book of First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That is what Peter writes in his, uh, we call it uh, his pastoral appeal as a senior elder of the early church. So very same, sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Peter is making it important that as a Christian, it is very important for you to be able to tell somebody else why you believe what you believe. As a Christian, you should be able to, in a positive, apologetic way, be able to give a defense for your faith. And if you cannot give a Bible reason for the kind of practice you uphold as a Christian, then it could be reason enough for you to stop believing that way or practicing that way. That is what they're saying. 
So I think it was the more we studied Jesus' life, the more we marvel at his ability to accept and affirm people. Although he issued scathing rebukes to religious leaders of his day, he gladly received those who were struggling with sin, plagued with guilt, and hopelessly condemned Jesus Christ to a lot of people with different problems and challenges. Now, for those who are open, those open to truth and to change, Christ was a blessing to them. But many times, people love debates, love arguments, but with no intention of changing. If they can't win the argument, even their souls won't be one to Christ. And so people love to debate, people love to argue, they love to question. Very many people question with the wrong intention. So those who can Christ with the right question or the right motive to them, the fountain or the sun of righteousness shone so bright that they have the hope of eternal life. So the depth of his forgiveness was infinitely deeper than the depths of their sin. His love knew bounds. Jesus never exhibited a tinge of pride or superiority. He saw in every human being one created in the image of God yet fallen. You see that although human beings have voted masses, abused their talents, and lost the dignity of God like manhood, the creator is to be glorified in their redemption. That is what Christ saw in all the people he interacted with. He saw people who were struggling, but who need to be given direct into their saving. And so when these people had interacted with Christ, their lives were changed in his presence because he cared for them. They rose to become what he believed they would be. So the life of very many people who interacted with Christ is a testimony. Look at them on blind. Then it's asking the Pharisees, you are thinking about him. Do you want to be his followers to give Christ? And he didn't care about any other thing but the fact that Christ had made him whole. And we see the same even though we want uh, more than 12 years of uh, uncontrolled blood flow. And so we have seen people when they come to Christ, Christ prays truth but to the winning attitude. Do you see some people sometimes feel like I had somebody one day say that uh, if Christ has said that the days of his death, but you, according to your speech or what you present, you say something else, then it's like you want to be more loving than God, and we can't be more loving than God. And so we are looking for Christ's deed, and we are seeing how we can also be able to employ the same Christians, especially as we develop an attitude. And so as we continue, there's something very important uh, called receptivity of the gospel. You see, means every time when you you bring the good news, you can even preach it in love, but there are people who are outside and ready to reject, ready to have a different opinion. One look at it deeply, especially among the Samaritans, Jesus Christ, our preacher, and to invite Jovin to lead us in that receptivity of the gospel. Welcome, Jovin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brother Kowili. Uh, indeed, as we develop winning attitudes, uh, we must also take uh, into consideration that uh, indeed there are some attitudes that can never bring results to us, that is, that can never win a soul to Christ. And as we uh, study this, uh, perhaps our greatest example is always Christ. And uh, Christ, while uh, on earth as a, a human being, uh, he worked tirelessly to make sure that his disciples had a different view of the gospel, to make sure that the Jews had a different view of the gospel. And one of the uh, the places that uh, uh, he bore great results was in the land of Samaria. Now, I, I just want to give us a quick analogy of Samaria, what used to happen between the Samaritans and uh, and the Jews. Before that, we can read from the book of John, uh, John, uh, the Gospel according to John, uh, chapter 4, uh, verse uh, 3, uh, 4, and 5. So verse 3 says that uh, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. 
So here we see Christ is leaving Judea and he's heading to Galilee. But Vasho says that but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Saika, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son uh, Joseph. So the Bible records that uh, uh, the gospel, uh, the, the Bible records that Jesus needed to go uh, through Samaria, and we need to know the reason why Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Before uh, before this lesson, we had uh, uh, covered on the tense relationship that was there between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans had a mix up of ideologies a mix up of uh, doctrines and various things that they believed in that the Jews never believed in. And this was uh, perhaps uh, one of the greatest I saw in their relationship. And so the Jews considered the Samaritans as people who never deserved to be saved, who never deserved to hear the gospel, or are people who will not accept uh, the gospel. But here we see Jesus uh, needing to go uh, through uh, Samaria. Why did he have to go through Samaria? Uh, we are talking about receptivity uh, to the gospel. Many a times uh, we go to some places, maybe it is in missions, or maybe we have been sent out to go and speak to some people, but they are so hostile, they cannot accept us, and uh, in one way or another, we, we always see that we give up. And this was the same, same thing that was happening uh, to as the Jews. Uh, when you look at these Jews, uh, they usually followed a different route. And that was the gospel, the, the, the John is recording in his gospel, that Jesus, uh, he had to go to Galilee, but then he had to go through Samaria. Uh, so uh, to the Jews, they used to follow a, an alternative uh, route, uh, so that they could not come into contact with the, uh, with the Samaritans, because they considered them as a people who are sinful, and once they came to contact with them, then they too will become uh, con uh, sinful. So to the disciples, to the Jews, to them it was so useless to present uh, uh, or to preach to the Samaritan because they were so hostile, they could not accept. But here, uh, the Spirit is impressing Christ and is leading him uh, to the Samaritans. And when he comes to the Samaritan, we see a wonderful work of the Holy Spirit, something that we call uh, the very first fruits uh, of the work that came uh, to the Samaritans. Jesus meets uh, a Samaritan woman. They converse, and Jesus uh, 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 talks to the lady, and she gets converted. And in this conversion, that is from John chapter 4, verse 39 uh, to 41, we see a wonderful harvest. And once these people had uh, accepted this very first message. We see now when uh, the likes of Philip are going to Samaria, uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 5 to 25, they have also a wonderful and an abundant uh, harvest in the land of Samaria. Why is this important to us to study, or what is the importance of this for us? Uh, at times we may lock some people uh, out or we lock them from receiving uh, the gospel because of the prejudices that we have, that maybe uh, they cannot be receptive to the gospel, or maybe uh, they will not readily accept us. But Jesus is saying that each and every ground for us is a fertile ground for us to proclaim the gospel. And therefore, we should go forth to them. We should have the eyes of Jesus. We should not have the eyes of the disciple. We are, the disciples saw and receptive hearts. Jesus himself saw receptive hearts. And uh, through this account of the of the of this uh, woman, we find out that the spirit can work in ways that we cannot understand to bring forth uh, good fruits in those whom uh, he has destined for them to receive uh, the fruits and uh, the truth. And that's why Jesus readily needed to go through. Samaria. So for us, let us uh, have the eyes that are divinely anointed by the Spirit so that instead of seeing impossibilities, let us see uh, uh, possibilities. In, instead of seeing difficulties, let us see opportunities so that uh, each and every person uh, becomes a candidate of heaven. I thank you very much, Barak. Thank you.
very important and stolid and uh, timely. So we are seeing individuals who can go through Somalia. In fact, it is being said, John writes and he says, the crowd had to go to Somalia. It means that it was the last resort. It brings something in my mind that uh, maybe when the Jews went to Galilee, they had to go through the longest route, they had to go through the longest route not to necessarily or uh, pass through Somalia. I think as Christians, you may have those people that uh, you try not to meet them because you just feel like they are, how do you call them, the bad and ground. So you will not get the truth. You try to go through a longer direction or maybe not to meet them. And so we get to another point where we have what we call an attitude adjustment. Quinta, attitude adjustment. This is of meeting those whom we think. We cannot win. Yeah, about attitude adjustment, I I find always this topic my, my favorite. While dealing with people, it is it is always key. And in the world, we call it ATT. And a lot of people are affected in our environment. When we, when we have an interaction with one another and you sometimes feel, it's always among the ladies. They say, eh, hey, and that's, that woman has a lot of ATT. And um, maybe for those who are in, in colleges, in schools, in classes, or maybe a lecturer, always attitude of how you speak to somebody affects us in our daily life. Live alone in the field of sharing the word of God or of winning soul. So attitude is very much key when you are interacting with other and also when you are talking to one another and more so when you are edifying one another. So there is a very good phrase that is written here that a harsh, critical and unfriendly attitude is going to drive people away from you and it is very practical. Even if you are able to witness your words, no matter how truthful, are much less likely to be received. So we, we understand that uh, our attitude alone is enough to push somebody away from us or even to, to make somebody close to us. And how do we know our uh, the attitude of, of, of a person? It is simple. Your words that you utter comes from your heart and it's from your heart that your attitude develops. So we have been given an uh, example of Christ Jesus. Christ accept, accepts us with all our weaknesses, with all our mistakes, and he freely comes and, and bids us to be his own. And yet us, we are so quick to, to, check, to, look, to look on people's weaknesses and start developing attitude and say, so and so is like this. And so you don't want to associate yourself with them. Think about Christ. Think about yourself first. Ask yourself, am I even worthy of Christ's love? But still, he loves me. And that is why the lesson writer brought about contrast between two women that Jesus had encountered with. First woman is in the book of Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 to 28, that I'm not going to read, but I'm going to paraphrase it. This is a woman who is calling Jesus to come and heal the daughter. And Jesus, we are, we, are, we are informed that Jesus ignores this woman. And the woman is called a woman of Canaan. And Jesus is ignoring this lady, and this lady persists and follows Jesus to a point that the disciple says that, no, can you chase this woman because she's just keeping on following us. And then they are going to have a dialogue with Jesus there when Jesus is, is, uh, is telling her that cannot give, uh, give the bread to the dogs. And uh, I, the, we see the woman still pleading and say, even the dogs are always give, given the breadcrumbs. Let me not say it more because you can also read it by your own. And then the contrast is with another woman who is compared with what Jesus did for her. 
and is using oil to anoint the feet of Jesus. And uh, we want to see Jesus' attitude toward these two women. And how even us, we deal with people. We have, we've already seen even how the disciples were seeing that the woman was so nagging. And at some point, human being, we were created that we don't like uh, someone who is nagging. But we are being told that the, the woman in Matthew 15 is a Canaanite. And Jesus is intentionally refusing her requests so that as she persists, her faith will grow. So even as at some point we may find ourselves in a situation like this, we should not take it directly that Jesus ignored this woman. Jesus was trying to achieve something out of her, that as she persists, her faith will grow. It was not an instant healing that came to her, but it took her, uh, let me say, a further milestone for her to receive what she wanted from Jesus. Now, this other woman is anointing the feet of Jesus, and Jesus is telling us very nice words. Let us, um, let us read what Jesus told him. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O oh woman, great is thy faith. Oh, we are reading Matthew 15, 28. Sorry, it says, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O oh woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt, and her daughter was made all from that very hour. I'm sorry. Now, this is, this is um, their first woman. And the first woman, uh, we want to notice the words that Jesus said, Great is thy faith. You know, those are so, such sweet words. Even as when someone is trying to know the word of God, let us use some encouraging words like, Oh, you have a great faith in God. Oh, um, how you, how much you're longing to know God and God shall surely do it. We shouldn't be just harsh so that people can run away from us. The one that I really wanted us to, to see is how Jesus answered this woman. Jesus told this woman that um, her story even will be told when the story of the gospel will be spread. It means that Jesus is encouraging this woman. Jesus is understanding the love that this woman felt, no matter how little someone's faith is, we should be encouraging these people with good words so that their faith can increase. And secondly, they can also feel encouraged to know more about Christ. And lastly, I'm going to comment that the woman who anoints Jesus' feet with expensive perfume, he was a Jew. And a woman of ill repute. We all know that, that she did not have a good repute. And a woman who, who had failed badly and sinned, but one of who was forgiven, transformed and made anew again. So when, when the disciples were seeing this woman, they were seeing a filthy person, a very sinful person. And that attitude is so bad. You see, when we walk in the streets, we see some people with pierced skins, with the tattoos, um, maybe with a lot of makeups, we already have attitudes toward them. Ah, these are sinners. They just look sin. They smell sin. They walk sin. But that is not how Jesus sees people. Jesus sees people differently. And to such people are the ones that we should speak words that are grace, that are full of grace. We speak words that are full of love so that they can see Christ in us and Christ in us can help them change. And that is all I have to say. Back to you, Barak. Thank you very much, Quinta. We have learned uh, something on the talk. They call attitude ATT. ATT, so I can talk to you. Can to you. But it's wonderful that we have attitude adjustment. Having had having attitude adjustment, we still have individuals who come out and say that, oh, you see, uh, just speak my mind. Just speak the truth as it is. Is it important that we be able to tell the truth in love? Is it important? And will it have a great impact in our ministry? Brian. Thank you so much, uh, Kowili. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you for uh, uh, my sister, uh, Quinta, and the uh, Jovin. The question, yes. It is very important that uh, love should be a very great pillar in our gospel. 
love subdues. There's no strong bonds in this world more than the bonds of true love. Love brings two strangers together to form a, a companionship in terms of marriage. Uh, bonds of love bring friendship together. The ionic bonds, the covalent bonds cannot be stronger than the, the bonds that uh, loves combine. Uh, but I want us today to look at some aspect of uh, this uh, friendship. The love uh, that brings uh, two friends together or the love that brings people together. Not, uh, not necessarily in terms of marriage, but <clears throat> maybe a friend, a classmate or so on, or someone that you, you confide on, uh, someone that you can call uh, your friend. I know most of us, or majority of us, or I think uh, the entire humanity, uh, people have their friends. You call them our best friends, you call them our confidence, you call them uh, uh, maybe even the colleagues as, as well uh, be your friends. Uh, can friendship alone uh, win people to Christ? The answer there is a no. Sometimes we might have many friends or people we may enjoy being with and enjoying being around us. Sometimes it might be very funny and those people who are easygoing uh, in creating friendship and talking and uh, enjoying that. But can that one alone uh, bring people to uh, to Christ. Questions? Just one check in the uh, your bubble bubble Ephesians for the verse is fifteen and the Bible records. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into Him who is in the head of Christ. Uh, the book of Ephesians reminds us that. If you have the truth, and we have to speak it uh, in love, human beings, by one of the motions that human beings to feel loved, self to the world or to those who do element that is, but it is not passed uh, with then in doing as is uh, backing out uh, 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 give just measures of, of the law but not bringing a people uh, to true definition of love um, who of which uh, uh, for us to understand when the basis of love we have to first <coughs> love our God. So Apostle Paul, Paul reminds us that the truth, we have to present our truth uh, in love. Friendship alone will not bring people to Christ, but unfriendly attitudes as well may drive, may drive people uh, away from Christ. I want us to check something a bit in Second Thessalonians. Uh, the chapter is 1. The verse is uh, uh, 1 after, up to 4. Uh, there's some specific things that Paul compliments at the church in, in uh, uh, Thessalonica. And uh, the Bible records Paul, uh, Sylvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thess Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So listen to this. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God al al always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So Paul recognizes uh, or compliments the church in Thessalonians. Uh, sometimes as we tend always to look the negative part of people around us. We tend to look how how someone is bad, how someone is not keeping the Sabbath, how someone is a prostitute, how someone is uh, a sinning in this way or another. But we tend to forget to compliment some little positivity in people. And Paul uh, decides to go the, uh, uh, the better way of first applauding the positivity of the church. Uh, of the uh, Thessalonians, and he recognizes the love of which these uh, guys have. He recognizes the faith, he recognizes the patience, as well uh, he, he recognizes uh, our patience, our faith, the love, and as well uh, he recognizes that their faith grows exceedingly great.
So it's a call even unto us that we may we may look at the positivity or the positive uh, parts of our friends, even our friend uh, friend zone. We should not uh, dwell much more on the negative uh, a bit of um, uh, uh, of those who we are. Close to us, and I read a quote nine, and uh, the plan of inspiration says that if we will humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tender hearted and pitiful, full of pity, there will be 100 conversion. Part. So, the question that you post is um, presentation to the gospel of ministry. Are we soft-hearted? Are we presenting it in a manner that we follow the footsteps of Christ? Are we showing in our speeches? Are we showing love in our sermons? Are we showing love in when we minister? When we minister in any in any uh, uh, platform that we are? Yes, the Bible uh, requires us to rebuke the sin, but the manner in which the sin is being rebuked will determine whether we will win a soul. Or lose us all perpetually. I want us to. Re- I want. Uh, lastly, I want to read a statement uh, from the book a "Message to the Young People." Uh, uh, the page is eighty-two. The paragraph is two, and it says, "Let me start from paragraph one." It says that keep yourselves away from the corrupting influences of the world. Do not go and and be then to places where the forces of the end are strongly entrenched. You don't go where you will be tempted and led astray. But if you have a message for unbelief. Believers, if you live so near to God, that do a work that will help them and will honor God. I, I pray not, Christ said, that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them the evil. And we recognize that we can only mingle our gospel if you have truth with truth without love is. I assure you, will turn away the flock far away from coming to home than if we present our truth with the love of Christ and present it in a manner that makes the, the emotions or make other people seize the truth and at the same, same time fail to be loved. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, back to you. Uh, COVID. Thank you very much, Brand. That was powerful. The concept of the truth in love is very important. A situation whereby a, somebody is saying that somewhere actually that people like to criticize those whom they think are not as good as themselves, and then they mock those whom they think are better than themselves. But in our evangelism, in our ministry, we need to look at it Christ's way. It is not love that makes you know a, a fault but you find a way of bringing it out. For instance, the book of Matthew 23, from 7, while Christ is giving his last uh, message to Jerusalem, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, I often wanted to gather your children together as a hand gathers her cheeks under her wings, but you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. While he was rebuking those who deserves to be rebuked, you could feel like uh, he's pouring himself out to them. And so when it has moved to the point where you have to give standing rebuke to something or to some kind of error, let them see that there is compassion. Don't be uh, while you're laughing and telling that, oh, my friend, you're not as good as me. You see, I do this, I fast voice, I do this. It's not what you do, but what Christ is. And so, move ahead. Now that we have presented the truth is in love, there is the important everyone feel great when they feel accepted. Everyone feel good when they feel appreciated. They feel good when they feel that their presence is a blessing to people. We ask ourselves, what is the greatest motivation for us to accept other people? Should we accept them because they are very nice? If that is the reason, because apparently, as we speak to a lot of people, are not nice. A lot of people have given us enough reason to 
not to accept, to accept them or think good about them. So it's the greatest reason that we have to be accepted. What if you be accepted based on your goodness? None of us could have been accepted of God. And so if we look at uh, our, first of all, our acceptance, Christ has not, Christ has not accepted us because you're great people. Look at Romans 15 verse 7. I accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you in order uh, to bring praise to God. Be kind, that is Ephesians 4, to the be kind and compassionate to one another, for each one, just as Christ has forgave you. So if there is a greatest reason for us to be receptive, for us to do away with the uh, unnecessary bigotry, it is because we have been accepted, not because we are nice people, not because we are great people, because God has loved us more than we even love ourselves. I like uh, another analogy that Paul did in the book of uh, Romans, uh, chapter 5, from verse 6, reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a man, some would even die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Look at that. Christ didn't die for us. You see, it's easier and uh, convenient for giving to accept those who are repentant. Those who are saying that, oh, you see, ah, I am sorry, I'm sorry, I stepped on your foot. I'm sorry, I misguided your girlfriend to leave you. I'm sorry. I told your husband that you're not a good wife and they should leave you. I'm very sorry. It is easier to forgive such people because we see that we are sorry. Sometimes it's so difficult to forgive that, oh, my friend, I told her that you're not right and, and I'm going to tell her again. Joving. It's not easy to feel anything you need to give such people. But God didn't wait until we were repentant enough. But we have a savior, a lamb slain from foundation of what? While we are still rebellious, Christ death for us. And so the greatest reason for us to accept Christ or to, to accept only Christ, but to accept people we interact with is because we have been accepted. And the people that Christ accept, Christ, uh, we need to also have the right basis or the right foundation for this. You see, Christ's uh, attitude toward those accepted was not do whatever you please, it's all right, we still accept you. But his attitude was rather, no matter what you have done, I am willing to forgive you and provide you with the power to change. No matter what you've done, not that I'm going to do, and you can do one. They don't do the more differently. So the, that you'll be forgiven moves us. The goodness of God moves us. Uh, to repent. To repent because we hate sin, but because we see what God has done to us. And what God has done to us is the greatest reason to also think well of other people, accept them. But we accept them uh, while pointing to them as Savior, who can give them uh, a Savior, who can give them the to be able to overcome all the things they're struggling with. I see, uh, we are continuing well, and uh, I think so far, if someone is following this study, and if we are preparing to become evangelists, then I think we are seeing the basics. It's not a love that encourages sin, but it is a love that is pointing people to a savior who can give them power and victory over sin. And so what about now truth, lovely presented? It, eternal truth, a biblical fact, lovingly uh, presented. I want you to uh, pause once again. Uh, thank you. I think we lost Kowili somewhere in between, but just to wrap it up, uh, uh, just a continuation on uh, the Tuesday section, a truth lovingly presented. 
there's something that I want to bring out very clear is that there is no conflict between love and truth. For if we say that there's a conflict between love and truth, then we will say uh, that God is conflicting himself. Because one, God is love, and two, God is truth. Uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, John 14, 6, uh, Christ says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this, uh, 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 which means God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for us, for our own salvation. In the same way he presented for us the truth for our one not separate them that we want to present love alone uh, or we want to present the truth alone if we present truth alone I uh, will end up as uh, uh, to, uh, to that will will end up or will lead us uh, to what we call a stifling of uh, legalism, which which uh, strangles a spiritual life, and then so-called love without truth as well leads to a tolerant uh, sentiment, uh, sentimentalism with no substance, living life on a sea of uncertainty. A truth presented in love leads to an authentic Christian experience that provides clear direction, purpose, and certainty. Uh, in simple, if we uh, talk of the truth without love, we are legalist. And if we talk about love without truth, we are room among us. Or we are just people who uh, can well say uh, ESAs. We don't have content. We don't have ingredient in what uh, we uh, present. Uh, let's refer to the uh, first Peter uh, 3 uh, 15. And uh, 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 Peter advantage is uh, fellow believers to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. As much as you defend your religion, as much as you defend uh, your beliefs, you have to do this or we have to do this with a lot of meekness and with a, a lot of fear. As, as well, uh, in 2 Timothy uh, 4 2, uh, Paul counsels uh, Timothy as he says that preach to the world, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. The key word I want to underline there is long suffering, being able to uh, 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 absorb uh, 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 all the hardship around and as well be patient enough. You know, someone who is long uh, suffering, you can say some, that someone who is loving, that's someone who is sober enough to present uh, uh, the gospel. As, and as well in the book of Titus uh, 3, if you read with me from verses 4, moving to 5, the Bible records. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So it is through love, through God's love. And that the truth that we have uh, today, even us, we can accept. A question uh, can be posed uh, to us. Why do you think that uh, God, after, after, after uh, uh, Satan fell in, in heaven, why do you think God did not consume him uh, immediately? Because we all know that God is a uh, consuming fire. Because he has, he has grace, and the, the truth that he presents is not forcing it to people. He presents it in a manner, in a loving manner, like a, a father to a son. He gives a second chance. He's a God of second chance. He's a God of opportunity. He's a God of love. He's a God of grace. And that is exactly even how us we should present our, our gospel, in the twinning the gospel truth with love, maintaining the principles of the of the truth, and the same same uh, time presenting it a manner uh, uh, that shows the kindness or the love uh, of the, his originator, who in this case is Christ, our Father. Uh, uh, lastly, uh, there's some uh, principles that we can develop uh, uh, to have a winning attitude even as we uh, come to the, the close of this uh, uh, section. First, we have to ask Jesus to impress uh, us that all people have spiritual longings and are winnable to Christ. Most often, we always uh, think that some people, ah, no, who you? No, this, this cannot be win. But we know deep inside each and every person's heart, there's that longing to receive Christ. There's that longing uh, to get uh, the gospel as well we have to seek to develop positive christ-centered relationships with those in our spheres of influence 
let our spheres of influence be encompassed, be uh, uh, revolving around a union, Christ-centered uh, 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 relationship. And then we have to pray for the opportunities to share our divine truth as well. Very important. We have to pray for the opportunities to share the divine truth. And lastly, present the Bible truth in a context of loving relationship. And that's what I, get, I come out with in this today's section. We have to present our biblical truths in the context of a loving relationship. Thank you uh, so much. Back to you, uh, Cody. Well, thank you very much, Bren. That was wonderful and uh, timely. It's love, the love that will not let me go. It's love, the love that makes us happy. I it's love that God shown into us. As we come to an end, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know what you're learning out of all this study. If somebody asked you to reduce the entire lesson into a paragraph of a few words, what will you do? John, you look, are you ready? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brother Kowili, for the opportunity once more. Uh, what I am taking home is a thought uh, from the Mount of Blessing, uh, that is page uh, 75. Uh, it says that while we were yet unloving and unlovely in character, hateful and hating one another, our Heavenly Father had mercy uh, on us. His love received will make us in like manner kind and tender, not merely towards those who please us, but to the most faulty and erring and sinful. This is a reminder unto us that even as we learn to make our friends or for God, we must be ready to change our attitude so that they become winning attitudes in whatever faculty of life we come to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jovin. Brian Winter. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, in a uh, paragraph, what I can get uh, or come out uh, with in this lesson is that the law of kindness and love wins at tenderness, acceptance, and forgiveness, open minds to the gospel, and treating others as Christ had treat, as treated us makes us makes all the difference in our witness experience. Thank you so much. I said Brian and Quinta, welcome. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Like, uh, what struck me most is Jesus accepted me. Though I'm a sinner, I also have the weight. It is written in the lesson, I think on Wednesday. I also have that weakness that nobody knows about, not even my husband. I, I am the one who knows. And still, Christ who is the only person who knows it with me, still is coping up with me, still loving me and showing, extending his message to me, then why should I now start rejecting people because of their sins or because of their characters or because of, of maybe also their attitude? So if Christ loved me, then I should also love others. Well, thank you very much. On my side, I will finish with a, a thought of all this. And I'm going to say that if you preach error, love, you enslave people. When you preach truth, love, you send away people. But when you preach truth in love, you insult for God. May the same be in the of all evangelism. May the same be in the heart, the soul. Of our evangelism in Jesus. And as we come to an end, I want to invite us to, that we may humble ourselves for a word of prayer. Let's believe you as uh, we pray. Father God, we thank you for the one that we have studied. We pray that it not only be a blessing to us, but it be a blessing to all who hear this. And even those who are not at this, but are engaging in the work of evangelism. And in forming soul, Father, we are praying to your spirit, may teach them what they shall say and how they shall say it, that souls may be that souls may be added to your kingdom. Let your spirit be the husband. You guide us for the sake of glory and our blessing always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and
Chicos, que te cuide.